nature not, I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case, open and shut No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut Today we'll go bird watching, tomorrow we'll catch toads The next day we'll take photographs of bugs along the road I never get the feeling that I'm in a rut that's why I'm a nature nut Well, I'm a nature nut I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things And I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case Open and shut No doubt about it I'm a nature nut Hi there, how's it going? Today is Moth Day and I want to start out by showing you how I stay in touch with the world of moths. This is my moth trap. Every night I turn on the light, the moths come to the light, they fall into this funnel, and they wind up in this jar because moths are too stupid to find their way back out through the funnel. Now, this is my way of keeping track of what sorts of moths are flying around in my neighborhood at, you know, various different times of the year. Most of the time I just let them go. If I get a lot of tent caterpillar moths, I'll feed some to my lizards, I must admit. And if I find beautiful moths, I'll take pictures of them. Got a Plusia venusta last year. That was a beauty. Ah, looks like it wasn't much of a night for moths last night. A couple of little tiny ones in there. And here's one good-sized moth. I don't think I've ever seen this one before. It's kind of gray with some uh, mossy-looking green bits on it. Have a look. Okay, now you see the way this little critter is shivering. It's doing that to warm up the flight muscles, the muscles that work the wings. And the reason it's doing that is because they can't really fly very well until their muscles are warm enough. In fact, while they are active, they are warm-blooded creatures. If your biology teacher ever told you that they had the same temperature as the air around them, wrong Ola. In fact, they can have a body temperature up around the 30 degree Celsius mark or even higher and their bodies are fuzzy to insulate against losing heat. So it looks like, oh, there, uh, there it goes. And we'll probably never find that moth again. I hope you got a good look at it while it was here. Seize the moment when you're dealing with moths. Carpe Lepidoptera. Some moths can hear bats coming and avoid them. Some even send out noises of their own to jam the bat's radar. You know, one way around the fact that there are so many small, difficult to identify moths is to focus on the few species of big, beautiful, easy to identify moths, like the giant silkworm moths in the family Saturniidae, a favorite of moth loving people everywhere. Of course, the most famous of all giant silkworms was Mothra. A huge silkworm about the size of a school bus and the sworn enemy of Godzilla. Look, Mothra has come to battle Godzilla. Life imitating art. Too bad we don't have those little tiny women that sing to Mothra. Mothra! Beautiful stuff. <sighs> anyway, I want to show you this moth in all seriousness because this is a very neat moth. This is actually a Cecropia moth, which is a pretty typical member of the giant silkworm moth family. This is a female. She has big fuzzy antennae, but the male's antennae are even bigger. And she also has a fuzzy sort of teddy bear body, which is absolutely full of eggs. They don't, uh, they don't have much of a mouth. When they hatch out of the cocoon, they live just long enough to attract a mate and then lay eggs and then they die. They attract the mate by giving off a perfume and the male can smell that perfume with his antennae and come flapping on in from even a few kilometers away, which is pretty amazing, uh, you know, I mean, could you smell one moth a couple of kilometers away? Not likely. Very interesting. Anyway, then she, uh, she lays her eggs on the appropriate species of plant, depending on which species of silk moth you're talking about, and the silk moth cycle starts again. Fantastically beautiful moths as well, with lovely velvety patterns on the wings. Whew, you gotta like them. Now, would you like to see what the cocoon looks like that that Cecropia moth came out of? 
Here it is. Looks like a really poorly made cigar with some fuzzy bits on it. That's the silk and uh, the leaves that the caterpillar um, wove into the cocoon when it was making the cocoon. And I'll cut it open and show you what's inside. How are we doing here? Is that... Oh, that's not good. No, I haven't. I got through the outer wall here. I haven't got through the inner wall, and I don't want to muck up the actual pupil skin because that's what I want you to see. See, if you were a bird, you'd have to go to a fair amount of trouble to get into this thing and eat that sleeping little pupa inside, which is probably why birds don't bother. Birds don't have scissors. Either. Oh, you're starting to starting to see the pupa in there now. And remember, the cocoon was built by the caterpillar in the fall when these leaves were a lot more malleable, you know, softer, and easier to work with. Okay, now, if I lift that off, you can see inside there, that's the shell of the pupa. This is the actual outer skin of the resting stage between the caterpillar and the moth, and that's... Uh, that's what it looked like. That's where the wing goes there, and the head down there, and the abdomen there. So how do you like that? What a nice, cozy little place to spend the winter. I'm here in the insect collection room of the Provincial Museum of Alberta. Now, did you know, you cultured folk out there, that there are over 100,000 species of moths known to science? That's an awful lot of moths. There are only 20,000 species of butterflies, about a fifth, and for comparison, about 9,000 species of birds, 1,000 species of mice, and only one species of moose. But when you go out moth watching or looking for moths, you can't just take your field guide and flip to the picture and identify every species because there are too many moths. It's too confusing and too many moths look like other moths and there are too many other moths as well. So what people who are serious about moths do is they create a moth collection for themselves or they make use of one of the many fine moth collections in moth-oriented museums around the world. Let me show you some of the moths they have here. Now have a look at this. This is just a tiny fraction of the diversity of moths. Over here, underwing moths in the genus Catacalla in the Noctuid family of owlet moths. These are the center of a cult of people who just love underwing moths. Very interesting. Sphinx moths or hawk moths. These are uh, relatively small sphinx moths. Sphingidae is the family. There are some big, big honking sphinx moths in the tropics. And here, tiger moths. Beautiful moths, a diverse group, very hard to tell apart, but lovely nonetheless. Here, an assortment of microlepidopteran moths in many families. I call them all mididides because I can't tell them apart. We've already seen the pyralid moths, another group of very small moths. Inchworm moths, geometridae moths. You ever wonder what an inchworm grows up to be when it grows up? There's...